I'm Regina Manyara and today we are looking at the impact that COVID-19 has had on the maritime and shipping industry. Taking me through this discussion is none other than the Principal Secretary, Madam Nancy Karigetu. Good morning and thank you for making time. Thank you so much. Now, Good when morning. we look at uh, the statistics that we've had were mm. from uh, WTO, it uh, predicts that uh, world trade is going to be impacted adversely and bring it down to around 13 to 32 okay. percent. Yes. Now, just looking, maybe you can help us paint a picture as to, you know, how COVID has, has affected the maritime and shipping industry locally, given in light of the current disruptions that we're having. All right. Thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss this very, very important topic, particularly in our national economic uh, fabric. First of all, to put it in context, uh, to put shipping in context, uh, shipping accounts for 90% of global trade. And uh, without shipping, uh, as someone said, half the world would freeze and half the world would starve. What that means is that Shipping permeates the entire fabric of our, of our life. When you think of the energy that we use, when you think of the transportation of food, our coffee, our tea, reaching markets, and then for us getting agricultural inputs, you can't avoid shipping. Now, when something happens to disrupt or to rearrange that, you know it affects you right mm -hmm. uh, on your doorstep. Now, what COVID has done, it has made us relook at the way we've always done business. But, but let me also take a backtrack a little and say that we're looking at not a new phenomenon. Shipping always goes through these kinds of revolutions. If you look at uh, the historical development, look at the uh, development of, you know, the, the change from the sailing ship yeah. into the steamships. Yeah looking at the containerization, it's always happening. Mm -hmm. So something like this is not the end of shipping as it were. <laughs> it's, it's not a, a shock salient. that the shipping and the maritime industry It's not the first do. time that uh, we, we are seeing this kind of revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very resilient industry, mm -hmm. uh, let me say that, because it's the, the way of life. If you think of the computers, the, the, the you know, the, like I said, the fuel, the way we live, mm -hmm. we can't avoid shipping and it always bounces back. Okay. So we, we are on the precipice, if I may say, of a big change in how we've always looked at uh, the shipping business and how it impacts on us. But I'm very confident that the shipping re industry will, will, will bounce back. Will bounce back. We're, all, we're already seeing, beginning to see that kind of uh, realignment. Okay. Yeah. Now, maybe before we took look at what the future holds for the maritime and shipping industry, yes. what impact has uh, the reduced volumes, you know, trade volumes from China had on the maritime industry? We know that it heavily relies on, you know, demand and also the movement of raw materials as you expertly put. Okay, we've, there's also something else that we, that is also important that we, we need to look at. This COVID crisis coincided with a, a drastic change that was happening in the shipping industry. On 1st of January, uh, a convention called MAPL Annex 6, and particularly, uh, if you look at the perspective of IMO, the, the strategy on reduction on greenhouse gas emissions took place. And it called for some adjustment of the shipping industry. So what shipping has done, uh, when we look at the numbers, of course, it means that we're looking at 11% of the av available containerized shipping, for example, being out of work. But when, when we look at, at it closely, we find that half of that are not ships that are, that are uh, generally out of work because of COVID, but ships that had already been taken out of work to undergo technological changes in retrofitting in something we call scrubbers. And this is to uh, reduce air pollution because this is generally what uh, the changes for the, the, for the, the IMO strategy on reduction on, on GHC was about. Mm -hmm. So we see that uh, much of the unavailability of shipping is not necessarily all related to COVID. Mm -hmm. If we look at the 2.72% uh, 
of the TEUs. I mean, 2.7 million TEUs that are out of work now. Some of them may be because of blank sailings, because of reduced capacity, but also half of them are because of that fitting uh, in order to be able to meet the new regulations. So it's going, yes, to rearrange the markets because of the world realization that we can't depend only on one side or on one market. Mm -hmm. But then if you realize also, China was among the first nations to undergo the COVID pandemic, but also one of the first to recover. And we are seeing now that uh, maybe shipping, uh, from the statistics that are coming out from end of last month, maybe shipping un underestimated or overestimated uh, the lack of capacity or, or rather the capacity that we would not need because China is already up. Mm -hmm. And also uh, shipping because of its reliance, uh, the way we rely on it for, mark I mean for goods and you know, emergency supply it's already working and that's why the world had to come up and put in measures mm -hmm. under the guidance of World Health Organizations to ensure that shipping must continue, the port remain open for okay. business. Now since we're talking about uh, uh, ports and looking at the East African uh, uh, community, yeah. or rather region, Mombasa port plays a major role Absolutely. in as far as you know sea trade is concerned. Yes. So from where you sit, uh, what are you doing to ensure that uh, sea trade continues uh, going through, especially with these uh, disruptions that we're having? What, ha what measures have you put in place to ensure that we continue working? As later? you're aware, Mombasa port, as many others, has never closed. We've always remained in business. And therefore, one of the first things we did is as the government, port community, private players, we came together and we realized that Ministry of Health has to take the lead, but also we must come up with protocols and a new way of doing business, uh, ensuring that the ship does not become the, the interface through which COVID comes on land, or that the port becomes the means through which COVID goes into the ships. So we came and we came together and came up with measures very quickly of how we are going to ensure that uh, shipping continues with the minimum uh, disruption as possible. Of course, part of that meant taking care and putting measures to ensure that, first of all, because it's human, it's a human disease, it's not cargo as such. So we put in measures that ensured that we knew and we put extra care on ships that came from COVID uh, affected areas. We also looked at the human element, the seafarers, uh, the health, that the, you know, their state of health. Uh, so therefore now there is extra uh, requirement for the captain or the master to make sure that we have records the health records, for example, temperature mm -hmm. of all the people, or I mean the people that are on board. And this information, because shipping works a lot on information, prior information to the port, even before you send information on cargo, you send information of the, on the services that you need when you're coming, way before the bills of leading, the ownership of, so that you know, uh, you know, the port is ready to receive the vessel. So on top of this now, we need and we've insisted that we must have the health information on health. Mm -hmm. And then when the sh people, when the ship docks, there are certain protocols that must take place. Health must board first. They must issue a free, we call it free pratik, to say that the other people can go on board now. Uh, and then we also make sure that the, the seafarers or the crew are basically in quarantine so that we, we reduce the interaction between the cargo workers and also the, the, the people who are on board the ship mm -hmm. so that we, we, we don't uh, cross infect. Yeah. Quite some measures there, but mm -hmm. I, I want to understand with the, this uh, Mombasa port operational, you know, with mandatory inspection of vessels, as you've said, uh -huh. and you know, following the health protocols, how has this impacted on uh, port operations in terms of efficiency? Have you seen delays and how have you dealt with delays? courtesy of you know this new directive or other protocols? Now, based on the 
protocols that we've, they were actually intended to reduce the delays. Some of the things that we used to do, of course, we've had to suspend. For example, in terms of the regulations, shipping works uh, through regulation, through what we call port state control. We also have flag state control and also coastal state control. When I talk of port state control, it means that you only catch the ship in terms of safety. You know, if I may use the example of the road, when a car is driving, the traffic policeman has the right to stop it and check on it. Now, this doesn't happen on, in, on, the uh, on the ship because the ship is at sea, they are not traffic policemen. So you catch the ship when she is in port. And therefore, surveyors from the maritime administration are obliged as part of the international network and framework of keeping ships safe. They are obliged to board, check on the certification, then the crew also in terms of their training, in terms of the certificates they have. So one of the measures we've done with the guidance of the International Maritime Organization is to extend some of those certificates uh, so that uh, we reduce the necessity of people boarding and then having to interact with the, with, with the crew and the masters and such. Then also the, the certificates for the seafarers, they are also time bound, the validity uh, depending on the, the, the age and the qualifications and whatever they have, uh, that, en that the skills they have to enable them to work on board ships. We had to issue a marina's notice to inform international shipping that the certificates we've issued, we've basically given them an automatic extension so that now the seafarers also don't suffer or lose their qualifications to be able to work on board ships. Mm -hmm. Now, one very important issue that uh, I must mention is to do with the human element. Because with COVID, uh, some of the measures that ports took is to prevent or, or to put a stop to shore leaves. If you know, shore leave means that when the ships come yes. and they're doing cargo work, the crew then have an opportunity to come on land. Yes. Uh, we have a network of institutions or, or rather all over the ports We've got what we call missions to seamen, and they are buildings or places set apart, basically in every port, run by NGOs, uh, the church sometimes, so that the seafarer, to reduce uh, homesickness. And seasickness in the, in the event that they had, <laughs> just be they on the ground. Yeah, they yeah. are able to come on board, yes. uh, I mean to come on shore, mm -hmm maybe get internet facility and contact their families. Yes, yes. Also have some, you know, recreation, rest and recreation, they are able to swim and So relax. have you done away with it? That has been done away okay. with because mm -hmm. of reducing the interaction. interaction. Yeah, there's the ones also on board and the ones on ground. The ones but on I ground. Want just, clear, just to understand mm -hmm. is that, um, mm -hmm. has, has this, these protocols and measures that you've put in place, have they in one way or another, uh, you know, um, how have they affected cargo clearance at this point? Is it slow or is it at the same? And if it is, uh, you know, uh, what are you doing to deal with this? Because we've also now, had the issue with, you know. Cargo clearance mm -hmm. is a port issue. It's a port issue. Mm -hmm. Now, what COVID measures we've done, of course, is to reduce the interaction, interaction. between the crew and whatever. But then when, now that you mentioned that, the port also has to make sure that their staff are not exposed. So we've seen, of course, reduced staff because you have to look at the people who are vulnerable, mm -hmm. put them uh, out of harm's way. Yes. But then, if with proper planning, and because a lot of it is automated and equipment and whatever, proper, proper planning of people, the prior knowledge of who is coming and what they'll need, and putting effective uh, measures in terms of equipment and operations, we have not, if you, if you will remember, we've not had a, an issue with port congestion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But, but like I was saying, the other issue that has been affected is crew change. Mm -hmm. uh, because ships, I mean staff who work on board ships, under ILO and under IMO protocols that want to ensure the safety of the ship, uh, the human element is very important. Very key. Yeah, and therefore, in terms of hours of work, in terms of their welfare, and how, of, how often 
uh, they, they, they get to go home because you and I, when we work on land, we have the buffer zone that in the evening you'll go back home to your family and it changes your mindset. But yes. when you're working on board ship, you're there 24 seven and therefore it's the same people. Agreed. And then stress can really affect you. Mm -hmm. And therefore we've got very time bound working uh, contracts. It's either three months for the very senior topmost or six months or nine months, okay. uh, depending on the level. Uh, what has happened because of COVID, we, we, we've seen a lot of restrictions, not just in Kenya, but in ports around the world, uh, in terms of onboarding and disembarking oh, yes, crew. Disembarking. Uh, but we, we are happy that recently the IMO has shown us the direction. Mm -hmm. We've got protocols and Kenya, uh, we, we are proud to have been among the very first ones to have come up with protocols that will now allow that kind of, that to happen because mm -hmm. it was beginning to to become a major problem a dicey when, situation now yeah. when you talk away from now the human factor as far you know as uh, shipping and maritime is concerned now let's yes. look at uh, we've already talked about the suppressed demand of raw materials from china and mm -hmm. that this is taking a different direction yeah. from you know globally people yeah. are shifting as far as maritime and shipping is concerned yeah. now let's talk about uh, crude oil car uh, crude oil carriers mm. how are they uh, you know faring during this uh, you know disruptions that have been brought about by covid 19. now if you look at shipping, you, you're looking at different aspects of that. And some have been more affected than others. Mm -hmm. The demand for crude, I mean for fuel, mm -hmm. has not, ha, has reduced, yes. But uh, we still need fuel. If you talk of areas like cruise shipping, that's not necessary. And it's been the, one of the most affected because of the, you know, reduction in travel and the control and the passengers. Yeah, you know, absolutely. you don't want to go on a cruise when, you know, you're not sure about the situations that are happening. But in terms of oil, that uh, is still on. Okay. In fact, I want to say that uh, some of the, the, the crew, when we started our seafaring job creation, we got some of them on cruise, uh, I mean on oil carriers. Mm -hmm. Those ones haven't been affected, they're still working. Okay. The people we've seen coming back, because their jobs are no longer uh, available are the people we sent on cruise shipping. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, mm -hmm. it's so crude oil, we should not be worried about, you know, transport. When you talk about crude oil, everyone goes in terms of uh, fuel and all that stuff. That is, uh, that's a that market. You know. Now, let's yeah. just moving around, uh, you know, the cruise industry, as you've said. Um, yeah. Kenya has had, uh, you know, different cruise ships landing on our, on our ports, you know, yeah. the no M M NMS Nautica, I know it's very famous for that, we might Queen not Elizabeth see it, too. yes, we might not mm. see it uh, this year, yeah. and you've mentioned that uh, the people that you've seen come back home are the yeah. ones that you put on, the seafarers that you put on, on the cruise, you know, cross ships. Yeah. So what next for this, uh, for this young people? Okay, at the moment, they are on leave, their contracts have just been suspended okay. for those who hadn't finished and for those who had not boarded uh, we're still on course and we should see them uh, going back now like I said before cruise shipping is a very I mean sorry shipping generally is a very resilient has been or has proven to be a very resilient industry and it may not be quick to to change or to adapt but it always does and already we've seen the signs that it's going to come back. Well, one of the issues that are happening, or the developments that we've seen happening, is issues around certification. Uh, like I said, we've got flag state control yeah. and port state control. Now, flag state control means that the ship is under uh, the control and the regulation of the country whose flag it's flying. And what, ship, what flagships do, they rely on, first of all, the la first line of uh, action or defense is the f maritime administration of the country where the ship yes, is registered. Yes. For example, now Kenya Maritime Authority will be uh, responsible for all issues affecting the ships on our flag. But because Kenya Maritime Authority is a flag, is a, is a maritime administration, or is a flag, State yes, flag will state. not be anywhere where the ship goes because ships follow cargo yes. or follow their business. We've got uh, classification societies 
And IMO is very clear that the country can delegate uh, to, to the classification societies. And a few have come up. If you look at the Lloyds, if you know Lloyds, yes. you know Lloyds Classification Society. Yes. So what we have seen now, classification societies, uh, and we've seen the first one being the German one, it's called DNV, GL, has already come up with a process uh, of certifying the ships in terms of uh, being disease free and fumigating and whatever else, the health measures that need to be taken. And based on that, coming, uh, having come up with those protocols, we are seeing that uh, one of their first clients, who is a cruise ship, is set to start business again in July. Mm -hmm. Which means that uh, we're already seeing the revolution that's going to be able to see uh, measures in place that are going to ensure that confidence, particularly, in the, in, the you know, particularly yeah. in the cruise shipping industry. Cruise in and therefore, mm -hmm. we, we, we are looking to see our crew go back. Mm -hmm. We hope they are. Good news there. Now, the yeah. pandemic has also, uh, you know, exposed glaring defects, rather just missing links in the global supply chain, especially mm. now given that China takes a huge bulk of that. Yes. Well, are, are we seeing dynamics? Are we changing? Is the maritime and shipping industry globally changing and trying, you know, just to, to find another way? Because we've already seen glaring, you know, we've been held on okay. what China wants is wants. what we give it. Now, what I may say is that shipping is demand driven is yes. a derivative yes. uh, industry and of course it will it will follow the demand and the markets now if we are going to see because that's the sign now that we are going to see a shift uh, from the over emphasis in certain spots in terms of manufacturing and in terms of industrialization uh, if we see that the world is looking for alternative markets of course that's going to affect uh, the shipping re industry because it has to react mm -hmm. to new routing, uh, to new markets, to new demand spots. And uh, it's still work in progress. <laughs> and therefore, we may not say where it is. We are hoping, of course, even as Africa, uh, mm -hmm. we'll position ourselves to be part of uh, that global supply chain. Mm -hmm. And we are yet to see how that is not an instant. <laughs> Coffee thing. Yeah. Now, when uh, Kenya hosted the Blue Economy Conference some yeah. years back, um, maritime and shipping was at the core and the center of that particular, you know, step towards the right direction. Mm. As we stand looking into the future, um, mm. I know with this project or the Seafarers project has employed a lot of youth. But now, what else is the shipping and maritime industry from where you sit doing to ensure that we realize and we harness, you know, the potential of the blue economy? Okay, one of the things that we, we, we really found out that we must emphasize on, and that informed uh, the entry of you know, jobs through the cruise shipping, uh, was skills development. Uh, because one of the, the, the areas that we knew we could tap in quickly was the hospitality sector. You know we have a product, world renowned, uh, through uh, you know, the training that we've done for our young people in terms of hospitality. Kenya has been uh, the African, the, as it were, place where even the hotel industry in the continent come for. And that's why it made sense for us to target the cruise industry because for brand building, you know, for letting the world know that we've got young people who are able to, to work and are available uh, to work in the in the shipping industry. Now the next frontier of course it's in the technical areas because now we've already got you know people on board coming. You know, out, out there there is knowledge that you can crew from Kenya mm -hmm. because for one we've got what people generally call the, the youth bulge. We've got many young people meaning therefore you can supply and keep supplying those people. Now as you recall, one of the things that happened after, after the conference was the launch of Bandari Maritime Academy in order to be able now to tap into the training uh, of young people in, in the other areas, uh, being able to, to produce and supply in large numbers the people who support the technical side of the ship. We've got now the hospitality side. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what we are doing is... Uh, coming up with programs that are work ready, that, uh, that prepare the youth in work ready programs that 
enable them to go into the, into the sea. And you're talking of being able to supply like air conditioning technicians, mm -hmm. uh, computer and, you know, ratings. If you think of a ship as a factory, all the kind of skills that you need that are in a moving factory. You kind then of preempted what I wanted to ask is ah. that have you seen uh, an upset since uh, the launch of this particular program? Yes. Have you seen an uptake from young people <coughs> wanting to fill in these positions, especially where shipbuilding and repairs are concerned, other than just you know working in the hospitality side of things? Have you seen that take? Uh, you know, you've, okay. You've come oh, up. When we started, I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, because the young people who are in the technical field didn't understand why we were doing that, why we were concentrating on who they, they called non-seafarers. Uh, non-seafarers because they've only been in hotels and other, in other areas yes, yes, yes. where they're the ones going into shipping. Uh, but the point, like I said, it was a brand building uh, tactic, you know, to place Kenyans on a world platform so that the shipping fraternity, because this is an industry that, you know, word of mouth is very, very important. If they know that Kenyans are available and they're good workers, then of course they'll come. And therefore, because of that, we've seen a very huge demand. Then, I mean, I mean for the courses yes. among the young people. Yes. Then what that did for us is that because of that reputation building, uh, if you recall early this year, before COVID struck, we had just uh, got a very good partner in terms of the, uh, the, the, Saudi, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia yes. to, to take now the technical people. And those are the people I'm saying that the ones they recruited haven't come back. And in fact, just before the closure, we'd just done a major uh, shortlisting exercise because they had said, we are coming back now. They started with officers, officer level but now they had just given us notice and indication that they were coming now to recruit the ratings. But as soon as we did that uh, shortlisting exercise, COVID struck. But going forward, uh, we are refitting Bandari College in terms of the mandatory equipment uh, and you know, structures that are required in order to produce internationally recognized uh, certificated uh, people and we are also developing the curriculums that are needed. Uh, the, minim the, the mandatory certificates that we must get, because if we are targeting as many shipping uh, activities as possible, not just cruise, not just oil, yes. container shipping, uh, row of vessels, then we need to have a broad spectrum uh, of certificates uh, that are required. We've got 26 mandatory and we are therefore looking to expand that, uh, that, that is that a point of, of policy but now I, I'm, yes. I'm looking mm. at uh, from a point of view as a parent or even a young person who you know is trying to just get their ropes uh, questions as they ask that this is an opportunity but how do I get on board how what do I what do I require do I have to go through university do, do I have to study a particular course so that I can come on board and get you know uh, uh, you know something on the value chain as far as maritime and industry shipping industry is concerned okay so what do I need now, what you need is first to understand that the ship, or rather the maritime sector, because there are those who don't want to wet their feet, and that's what we tell them, then you can work on shore, in the ports, in the cargo, in the transports, in logistics, marine insurance, the law. I'm a lawyer myself, mm -hmm. although I'm working in the maritime sector. So there are many sectors, and it's, it's, a, it's an industry that's open to a lot of you know, people and training. Now, when you leave that then, then you come to the idea, you know, to the understanding that, like I said, the ship is like a moving factor, you know, yes. factory. factory. You've got people at floor level, and you've got people at the mid level, and you've got people at the highest. Okay. Therefore, it means that from the university to the, you know, to the, to the lowest trained, if I may say, uh, the people who give up hope because they don't get the grades to get them to university, TVET institutions, hands-on skills, you know, very, very important. If you're able to, to do something with your hands, and that's the message I tell young people every time I have an opportunity, that the days when, if you didn't get a need to get you to university, then you're branded a failure, those are long gone. And it doesn't happen in the shipping industry. And the beauty about this is you can start up at 
at the floor and be able to get to the top because it's incremental uh, improvement of the skills that you get. Now, but the other thing I have to tell the young people who are watching me today, character, very, very important. Uh, back in the old days, <coughs> if ships, you know, you know, it's like paramilitary, the command, you know, control in the ship, very, very important. Because the safety and the security of the vessel depends on the people and the interrelationships of the people working on board. And therefore, Hakietu doesn't work on board. <laughs> you I wouldn't like have them, people picketing on no, the deck No, you below cannot deck. picket because the safety of the ship depends on all of us working together. And therefore, that mindset is very, very important. The other thing I have to tell them is the, the attitude of work, you know, the approach to work. You must be ready, you know, to do more than is actually allocated to you. Because that's how, even with the young people that we sent already, mm -hmm. that is who, when, when we see the grading that they are given when they come back there, because they, you, you have a Siemens book that records your conduct on board ship. And therefore the reports we are seeing is hard working, always helpful, always with a smile, you know? That to do can do attitude, very, very important. Mm -hmm. But then I know I stepped on some toes once when I said this, English language. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, elaborate on English language. Maritime, l maritime, all over. Language is English. And if you go on board a ship made in Russia, if the manual is in Russian, there must be an English translation. So that's the universal language. And therefore, communication. How will you communicate with somebody? Uh, because, for example, if we take the example of the bridge, that's where the navigation equipment takes place. You know, you get an order of what you're going to do. What move do you make? Two degrees, whatever. If you don't understand, nobody will speak to you in Swahili or in your mother tongue. It has to be English and you have to understand immediately, you know, what you're being told. And therefore, we are telling them, as they study, put an emphasis on the English language. Uh, because we had situations when we were recruiting, they must pass a computerized English test. And we saw, we had an incident where one fainted, because now he's passed the technical, but now he has to go and sit and do the English language from a computer. You log in and the computer gives you instructions. If you don't understand and you're not able to follow through, then of course it means you fail. And also, the way the, in, the language is structured, I mean the language test is structured, is you go, it, it gets your level from the bottom, then you go level two, okay, then proceed to level two, then it determines whether you'll be an officer, where you, you know, where you will work. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I need to be able to communicate in English. To communicate in English and to comprehend, in comprehend English. and communicate okay. in English. In the service industry, a second language will be a very huge boost for you because if you're talking of the cruise uh, industry, the guests could come from Japan, they could come from the Arabian countries, you know. So if you have Spanish, Italian, whatever, then of course your suitability for the kind of market, or for the market that you go to work in, then may change. But in terms of the technical, you know, work, you must have the English language. And like for Bahri, when we were working with Bahri, the Saudi Arabia shipping line, they didn't come to Kenya. All the interaction, the interviews, the, the, the elimination, you know, in terms of uh, who they will take, was all done online. So unless you can communicate and make yourself understood, then it means you, you don't get, you know, your leg inside the door. Uh, of course, if you have the basic language, then you'll remain on the floor level. So I'm asking and we are pleading with the young people. The phone, the telephone, the smartphone has really reduced uh, our reading and our, you know, English language because uh, we have our own language there. We talk of my bad, 
Mm -hmm. My bad. Or I use an emoji. You know, yeah. use an emoji to say something. <laughs> or you know, you, you say this, that, yeah. whatever. We understand each other at our level as youth. But sadly, that won't get you on that level. Suddenly, I would yeah. actually want to understand why that gentleman, was it a gentleman or a, or a lady who fainted, the technician? Yeah. Well, I would understand their frustrations because yeah. you've done the hard part. And you've which passed. Which is the technical part yeah. at yeah. first. But now I cannot comprehend and mm. communicate in English. Yeah, so it's easy. Let them read more, mm. write more, practice more. And it, it will come easily. It's just that we've become lazy because of the computers and the oh, TVs they say and whatever. Oh, they say that I so they can communicate on the internet. Well, most people don't, uh, you know, put in more work to just reading yeah. a book. They find it yeah. old-fashioned. You know. In the 21st century. Now, yeah. what are the, uh, the future pros uh, prospects uh, for the maritime industry point to investments in artificial or other intelligent freight technologies for monitoring, mm -hmm. um, regulation, you know, facilitation and such. Is Kenya ready to jump onto this mad world? Okay, like I said, uh, shipping revolutions take time, but they happen. And even before COVID, uh, this was something, you know, when you talk of smart shipping, it's a revolution that is slowly, has been slowly creeping up on us. You know, if you take uh, a note of the developments in the world generally, uh, shipping has always relied on communication. I, if you think of sending the manifest in terms of what's loaded on the vessel, sending it prior to the ship's arrival, it's one of the conditions anyway of, of ships coming to the port of Mombasa. You must send your manifest within a given uh, time. When you talk of sending the, the bills of lading now, everything has been going electronic. Clearance of cargo and such things. And it makes sense uh, when you look at uh, where, you know, the world we are living now with satellite communication and communication with ships being almost real time is not like before when we had, you know, huge areas of the sea not covered and when you couldn't even, uh, as an owner of a ship, get in touch with your vessel or even the crew. Uh, th then we've got the other aspect is the cloud the capacity to store a lot of data for, you know, for record keeping, for ship, you know, for even for research, for being able to plan ahead because you know now the history and how the behavior is. Then you talk of the smartphone, you know, being able to come up with apps that can do so much uh, and also the internet of things. And therefore, uh, shipping is right in the mix of all that. Oh, well, yeah. And in Kenya, if, if, you, if I may say that we, we've got Kentrid, you know, the single window, and uh, this is something that uh, IMO has really emphasized on. IMO has a convention called Facilitation of International Trade, and which seeks to, to reduce the amount of time uh, the ship spends at oh, sea. Oh, and therefore, one of the ways that is, is very important towards that is getting everything done on a single platform so that you reduce the number of uh, the people who interact with the vessel, the documents they need, the compliance issues, and therefore you are able to do it, all that. And as you know, uh, that's one of the things that we, we've been able to, to do qu quite well. In fact, last week, uh, we had our brothers uh, from, I won't name, but one of the African countries come to Kenya and we had a meeting on Friday because they want to learn from us, uh, they want to implement, and they thought, uh, they decided that Kenya is far ahead uh, of us and we, we had a very, very, very good meeting with them and they were, they were quite happy that, and, and they are ready now for us to lead them mm -hmm. uh, into, no. the, into that space. That is good. Mm. Now, we have some feedback here. <laughs> ah. A concerned Kenyan says, M. Wanja says, um, <laughs> Three months on, I'm yet to receive uh, my goods uh, that were coming via ship. Was it is idea? I don't know how she intends you to say idea, but maybe she's just talking. She's pointing to the issue of delays. Yes. And uh, I don't know. Do you because of the, you know, because of the, like you said, the market and the shift. Ships have had to, you know, like when we used to get ships direct from China. Now, of course, a ship owner will look at the cargo. How much is it? So 
when you hear of sometimes blank sellings because the market or the goods do not justify me taking this route and therefore it takes a more circuitous route. But we can be able to check, she can check with Kenya Maritime Authority, mm -hmm. Commercial Shipping Division, to get some uh, professional advice on that. Right. Yeah. Mm. M1J, you've had that you need to check with the Maritime Authority so that they can give you direction in regard to that particular mm. you know, shipment that you had three months. Well, uh, there's so many other things and other challenges that may be going through other than just COVID or different, mm -hmm. you know. It will be explained to you on that uh, particular page. So then someone else here says, um, with CISIC, <laughs> I get CISIC. Seasickness. Yes, I get this. Uh, yes, I get this. I actually, I mean, they, they've written, I get seasick. Okay. But I want to be employed in the maritime and shipping industry. Like what I can I get over seasickness? I think they want to know if, if, if it's something that you can get used to. You know, when you say nine months on board a ship, or six, or six, or three. I want so to encourage them first that. Uh, People have done it, even people who start off with seasickness and they've overcome it, they can do it. But then, like I say, you don't have to wet your feet to work in the maritime sector. But you can they work are, offshore. You can work offshore. I and think the way this person is writing is that they're maybe targeting, you know, it's, it sounds exciting, especially to be on a cruise, you know, different ports, this that you time know? to sh shore live and all that stuff. You get to see Like I so tell much. them, it's uh, seeing the world on somebody else's pocket because the ship owner lifts you from here to US to join ship and lifts you back. You can take your holiday any, anywhere you want. And uh, the other thing I, I may mention is that, uh, like I said about shipping revolutions happening, you know, over time and us adapting, having to adapt. Uh, because of what COVID has done and the, and the stress and the agony that it's caused uh, the seafarers, we are, we are likely to see, uh, uh, one of the predictions is that uh, uh, because of the hardships, salaries may lower, may go down, but that's relative, like I tell people. Then it may stop being attractive for some people. We've seen this because seafaring has gone in cycles. It started in Europe, for example. Uh, initially, the seafarers came from Europe. But with time in terms of technological changes and you, you know, with internet and being able to work from home and making as much money, entertainment yes. industry, it shifted to you know, Asia. And we're looking to shipping now, I mean not as a seafaring, coming to Africa. And therefore, salaries are relative, you know, because based on the GDP, if someone, uh, if I may mention, someone who is a, uh, swimming pool attendant earning $1,200 on ship. That's relative because in some jurisdiction it will be very little money. But for us, it's a lot of money. And therefore, I want to urge my mm. upcoming seafarer to be, to, to read up more and I think get resilience. When, when the president was launching this particular uh, project, yes. I think Kenyans were amazed and, you know, 80,000? For the, for, the yeah, for, for the beginner, 80,000 gross. That's, that's for the cleaner, for yes, the cleaner. That's yeah. a cleaner. Yeah. So here, yeah, be, uh, be encouraged. Uh, you've, uh, you've DM'd me and just saying that you're seasick, but you still want to work in the maritime and shipping, shipping industry. And from the way you're writing here is that you are looking at the cruise industry, rather being top deck, just moving from one place to another. Uh, Madam Pierce here has said that seasickness is something you can overcome. Mm -hmm. But don't also, you might also get an opportunity if that doesn't happen and you still are ready to work, uh, but you do not necessarily have to wet your feet. Yes, yes. And tell him that he doesn't have to share his meals with the fish. Fish are well fed, <laughs> so he can. Yeah. Yes, Remember you do not have to share your meal with the fish, as Madame Pierce has said that. Yeah. Now, in conclusion, uh, Madame mm. Pierce, um, we see that uh, the transport industry is one of uh, the sectors that is going to be taking mm -hmm. the lion's share of Ukur's attorney's 2.7 trillion budget for the fiscal year 2020-2021. What are your expectations from where you sit? Yes, uh, getting enough to kit the, the, the sector to deliver. Uh, but, but, but having said that, let me also say that uh, the biggest investments we can make in this country and which we are looking to make is in skills development for our young people because this is a regulated sector. You can't walk from the street into the vessel. 
you have to go through a very detailed uh, and very prescribed skills development and certification program. So unless we have the basics that are required, because you know, you imagine that you're training somebody to work on land, but I mean, you're training them on land, but they must have an idea of what it takes or what to expect when they get on board the ship, which means therefore you must be able to simulate to them and make it as real as possible on land what they're going to face when they get on at sea. So investments in capacity building, that's the first thing we must look at. But that said, some of the issues that we need to put in, in place may not necessarily be you know, capital driven because we're talking of integration of policies uh, in order to drive the maritime sector. Uh, being able to look at, you know, when, when we talk of blue economy, I tell people that it's a mindset. Blue economy is, is thinking and bringing everybody together at the table to be able to give and take. Because uh, sometimes we look at short-term gains but look, forget to look at the bigger picture. And therefore, it's sitting around the table, coming up with trade-offs that today I may forego, uh, for example, taxation in this area in, you know, in return for being able, at the long run, to reap maximum benefits. Mm -hmm. I, may I may use as an example something called bankering. Uh, bunkering is the fueling of ships, basically, and it, it takes a lot of give and take. It will take a lot of give and take for us to be able to develop Mombasa as a bunkering center. Not just to be able to, you know, to, to do it for the sake of it, but the, for the ripple effects that are attendant to it. For one, being able to lower our freight rates because if ships are avoiding to come and take bankers in Mombasa because of our fiscal uh, regulatory regime that we have, which pushes the prices higher, it hurts us in terms of freight because then uh, a ship owner will be able or, or you know, will do his math and you know, when they, they do the voyage calculations and they, he's in it for the money. <coughs> he's made an investment and he wants to make as much money as he can. Profit, yes, yes. Yeah, profit, yeah. If he looks and sees that if I buy in Mombasa, then I don't have the, the, the profit margin reduces. But if I buy in Singapore or in Dubai, then it means I can make more money. But what does that do to us as a country? It means that he carries fuel for the in and in out, out yes. voyage. We miss out on the, on the business. What does that mean? We miss out on the business he could have brought to Mombasa to buy. But then we also miss out on the cargo space because it means he cannot carry beyond a certain weight. It means then he will reduce the cargo or carrying space or capacity and then your freight and mine get more. So uh, I'm looking at this as you know, give and take and being able to leverage uh, on the economics and getting more. But then also we've made uh, profit on the on the freight because the freight rates will reduce and therefore inflation and cost of goods landed you know will go down okay. but then also we'll be able to leverage on other businesses that come with that there'll be the supplies because if i'm taking bankers in mombasa i might as well take food you know provisions for my crew which means wanjiko who is farming fruits and cabbage and carrots and eggs and chicken is also able to supply Based on that also, if I'm coming to take bankers in Mombasa, why don't I do my crew change in Mombasa as well? So the crew that I'm changing will disembark in Mombasa. They may go on holiday because it's an opportunity to be in Kenya. They may go on safari, which means there is a two-hour operator there making money. KQ will be able to lift that crew to whatever destination, destination he's going. But then again, the crew who is coming to join the vessel will also use the same. Academy. So we're talking of re recalibration <laughs> of our policies and our thinking and our, you know, seeing, having a 
further view mm -hmm. of where, where we want to do. So that's what I'm looking forward to. A futuristic view of uh, the maritime and especially the shipping industry. Change Absolutely. of policy. Sen Sense of change of outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, integration of policies. You know, so that uh, the areas with the best op you know, opportunity to contribute to the economy then get to be able to... Mm -hmm. Prioritized and change. Yeah, cross-pollination, if I may call it, you know, uh -huh. so that you, you, you get the areas with the biggest capacity to produce to the economy being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very well said. Uh, that is Madam uh, Nancy Karigiza, the PA, uh, Principal Secretary, Maritime and Shipping here, just uh, giving us an overview as to how uh, the maritime and shipping industry is behaving uh, given the current disruptions that have been, you know, um, brought about by COVID-19, but she has emphasized that the maritime sector remains resilient and that if that a particular issue was to stall for any reason, some would freeze <laughs> well, some others, would and others would starve. Thank you very much for making time to join us. We take a short break. When we return, Rama Gupta will be taking over the rest of uh, this conversation. I'm Regina Manyaragita. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you.